what really gets my dick hard is Hey everyone, this is Tom Quee here from Alpha Metallica, and you're listening to Metal Up Your Podcast. I got something to say. I kill your baby today. Welcome to Melvin Podcast. I'm Ethan Luck. And I'm Clint Wells. And this is episode number 83. And we're getting right back into our Year in the Life of Metallica series. And this is 1987. For those of you who don't know, we're an all-Metallica podcast. Ethan and I are two professional musicians in Nashville, Tennessee, who get together once a week, just like right now. Right now. Here we are. Here we are at HQ1, by the way. Yeah. And uh, we talk about our favorite metal band, Metallica. We are, this is maybe, I don't, I'm not good at math. What installment is this in our Year in the Life series? We, well, we started did, in 80. We did 81, 82 of the same episode. Right, that's one. 83, that's one. 84, 85, 86. This is our sixth installment. <laughs> you heard it here first. The mathematician himself, Clint Wells, has decided this hey, is the 12th one. I chose a different path, all right? I, ch- <laughs> I chose the guitar instead of the uh, abacus. I know, speaking of math, I know how many strings are on my guitar. Eight. <laughs> exactly. Whenever I'm playing my corn covers, I know how many strings are on that guitar. Got the life. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Got the life. Well, here's what we've been doing. What we've decided to do is document every year of the existence of Metallica in excruciating detail. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there will come a day when this podcast is, we, where we, we, we have our last episode. Say I don't... it ain't so. <laughs> whoa, whoa. My father, stepfather, tonight. Tonight. Uh, there will come a day when we, we pack it up on this uh journey yeah of course and it'd be you know we thought it'd be really cool to have a whole document of extensive conversation about every year right of the life of metallica well it's easy to like talk about you know i'm like master of puppets or whatever or mm-hmm. justice you know that of course is the bulk of an eight in the year 86 that's when it was released right. you know all that stuff touring but, with ozzy and all but this. it's really cool to dive in a little deeper to what happens surrounding those records you know it's like yeah they went on tour but let's talk about specific tour stories what happened things like that much like a good guitar solo it's about the negative space exactly man right it's about things that happen right in right. between the notes right oh, right of course yeah like no one's gonna argue that the notes aren't important obviously the note choices etc are important of but, course yeah. but what i'm interested in is peeking under the hood and seeing what's going on in the negative spaces that's right you want to see them cylinders firing well they needed to recharge. They need to go home. James broke his arm again. That's right. Skateboarding. That's right. This is Tom Quay. Well, hello. Hello, hi, and welcome, and hello, <laughs> and greetings. It's me, Tom Quay. <laughs> From Alpha Metallica. Alpha Metallica. I, uh, I actually spent... Um, to, I had a my I had an unusually long bus ride this morning. We got into town at like 1.30 p.m., and I got caught up on Alpha Metallica. So nice. I have like Tom's voice ever present in my head today. Oh. Hi, and hello, and greetings. It's me, Tom Quay. It's only Tom Quay. <laughs> talking about the Orion Festival. All right, anyway, so we are going to talk about 1987. Before that, real quick, go leave us an iTunes review. Uh, it only takes a second. Just do it. It only takes a second. You don't even. You know what? You don't. We're beyond. We're, you don't even have to write anything. But if you yeah. just go hit the five star thing, the rating, yeah. it goes a long way. When people look up Metallica, uh, they want to know about if there are any podcasts that exist that talk about Metallica. They really base um, their decision on which one to listen to right, on yeah. those ratings. So, well, and we've gotten emails and feedback from people that like, uh, "Hey, I was just on iTunes searching for something else Jason that Jason Newstead, Newstead played yeah. on, and I came across your podcast." So that's that's how we're visible. Like, if you on our end when we upload these episodes, we put in keywords that are searchable words on the World Wide Web or on iTunes. So if one day someone's like, "Hey, I want to see if Rob Trujillo has been on some other recordings," we'll actually show up. Mail up your podcast right below all these Rob Trujillo, uh, Trujillo, Trujillo search results. So it is helpful. Leave us a review. You can write something if you want. If you're kind and feeling up for it for the day, please write us something. Uh, if not, just click the five star. It, it takes well, some time. And I'll say this. If you really do like the show, I mean, the show is free and um, we do work real hard to make the show. Correct. Our schedules are, are pretty dicey sometimes. 
at the bare minimum, it would be a way for you to say thank you for, yeah. for the content. So yeah. think about doing it. If you don't want to, that's also okay. We're going to fucking roll right along no matter what. That's right. This train We're here for rolling. you every Monday, no matter what. No matter what, you motherfuckers. In addition to leaving <laughs> or not leaving the review, if you really do want to give back on a financial level, we have this really cool thing called Patreon. You're going to hear a commercial about it later. One of the coolest things you do get from the Patreon is Ethan and I made this really cool little covers EP of Metallica yeah. songs called Cover Our World Black and Volume 1. Part two will be coming out in the fall. Yeah, I'm going to get started on mine real soon because now I'm done with my record. So Yeah, now that you're done with your record, you're free to... Well, now you got to make your acoustic record. Though. I'm making the acoustic version at home, yeah. But I, I, I'm... Before... Before it gets released, I will write. I will record songs. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully that's how it works. But anyway, these these uh, the Patreon is really the only way to get these records, and they're really cool. There's all sorts of other incentives over there. You're gonna hear about that later. We do want to give a shout out to Bruno, Ivan, Acosta, and Dan Murphy. Thanks, guys. Bruno increased his pledge, and Dan got on the ride over there at the old Patreon. Nothing wrong getting on that ride. We really do appreciate that. All aboard. It's um. <laughs> <laughs> the SS Metal Every Podcast. <laughs> now we're on the ocean. Ahoy! Uh, hey man, anytime I'm I have sailing, <laughs> I'm sailing. <laughs> what about Bob, dude? When are we going to do our movie reviews? Uh, very soon. What about Bob coming to America? Yep. So I married an axe yep. murderer and Spinal Tap. And Spinal Tap. Yes. We have to fucking do it. We have to. Okay, we're gonna we'll do make it. it happen. We're gonna do it. People are gonna be all excited about our hundredth episode that's coming up, not too far away. They're gonna be like, "Oh, what are they gonna talk about? It's gonna be amazing!" Like for our hundredth episode, we're reviewing Coming to America. You know, we are at episode eighty three, which we've even done more because we've done these revisited and bonus episodes. Yeah. We're, we're getting it's up. It's crazy. There. It's really crazy. It is kind of crazy. It's weird when I, whenever I upload the episodes, um, it shows our total amount of episodes in Simplecast the service we use. It's, Sponsored by SimpleCast.com. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, we've had the revisited episodes, uh, the Middle, Middle Free Podcast radio episodes, a couple tribute episodes. Um, so I think in total, we're at like 95 or something. Like we're technically going to hit 100 before we officially hit 100. But right. The official full length episodes are what we really count. So we're not far off, man. You know what? And we, Ethan and I have talked about wanting to make the 100th episode special, but we still don't really know what we're going to do. Maybe if you if you have any ideas about what we should do for our hundredth episode, let us know. Um, can you have James Hatfield on? <laughs> oh, that's we hadn't thought that, of that. That's a good idea. We hadn't thought of that. Let, let me call up Papa Het Smith and see what's going on. I think Jason would do. He's not doing anything nowadays. Well, he he, he creates murals now and plays acoustic music. He he makes vegan <laughs> Satan at the chop house, and he makes murals. Murals. <laughs> We'll get on that. Well, yeah. anyway, we're on the socials. Maybe you can let us know on Instagram or Twitter, Facebook. We're on YouTube and Spotify. Um, we have a really cool website called MetalPrepodcast.com that was really only made possible by our patrons. That's right, yeah. Uh, and, and the internet. And, and Al Gore and, and who like invented the internet. I'd like to thank Al Gore, um, all the patrons, and just in general, the technology. Steve Jobs. The technology of the internet. Rest in peace. For making our website possible. Bill Gates. The most direct way to get a hold of us, as it's been since the very beginning of the show. Is our phone numbers. And it's it our pager. 615. <laughs> <laughs> Page us anytime. <laughs> No, you can email us at metalupyourpodcastshow at gmail.com. We read five emails a week to dip in on the Metal Up Your Podcast community. And we're going to do that right now. Let's take it to the email corner. Let's do it. All right. Our first email is from our longtime friend, multi writer inner, and Danny, a patron. And a patron, Danny Santana. No relation. Um, hello, dude. <laughs> I it reminds can't... me of uh, the Michael Bolton scene in Office Space. And okay. up here next, we have uh, Michael uh, Bolton, and they both look up. Any relation, ask. any relation to the pop singer? No, it's just a coincidence. <laughs> man, you know, I got to say, for my money, oh, what does he Doesn't say? Doesn't get any better Doesn't than when a man to... loves a woman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know what? You like Michael? Do you like Michael, Michael, Michael Bolton? Sure, sure. He's okay. You're damn right, he is. I, I, I admit it. I celebrate his entire catalog. <laughs> Should we put that clip? in I know here? we got some of that wrong. So let's actually hear what it real, <laughs> really sounds like before we hear from Danny Santana. Let's see. You are Michael Bolton. Yeah. Is that your real name? 
Yeah. Are you any relation to the pop singer? No, it's it's just a coincidence. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. I love his music. I do. I'm a Michael Bolton fan. For my money, I don't know if it gets any better than when he sings When a Man Loves a Woman. But you must really love his music, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's 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 pretty he's pretty good, I guess. You're goddamn right he is. <laughs> <laughs> Right. So tell me, what's your favorite song of his? Mm. <clears throat> I don't. I don't know. <laughs> I, mean, I, I guess I sort of like them all. <laughs> so Ryan, I'm the yeah. exact same way, but it must be twice as hard for you being to have the same name as him. I celebrate the guy's entire catalog. Anyway, let's get down to business, Michael. You know, you, you can just call me Mike. All right. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> so I love good. that movie. Maybe Office Space will also review. Please don't ever um, do a reboot of that movie or a sequel. Leave it as is. Leave it alone. God damn it. That is so true. Please Leave don't. Leave these great movies alone. Please. Please. For the love of all things funny and holy. God. Anyways, our first email from Danny Santana in relation. Uh, hello, dudes. The last episode made me think of something. Uh, I'm saving so much money by not, he said, not in all caps, having to buy any expensive pocket watches or Moroccan candles. Oh, sorry, oh, candles, oils. Uh, my wife, oh, in Bora voice, my wife, my wife uh, loves Metallica and we so often rock out together. Uh, I don't give her enough credit for being awesome, and so I thought I'd do it here. Uh, thanks for again for Middle Up Your Podcast Mondays. P.S. My new vinyl collection is coming along nicely. Picked up Queen's Live Killers album for only two bucks. See, that's the joy of vinyl collecting is yeah. finding stuff in the wild for a great deal. Yeah. Because then you connect it to a story and a place. It's a whole, it's a whole experience. You can. I have bought records off Discogs. Ethan and I were just talking yeah, yeah. at length before we started rolling about Discogs. I have bought records off Discogs or various online places. But the true joy of it is finding it out there. Oh, yeah. Thumbing through yep. a crate or thumbing through just a section and you're like, hands, Fuck. hands getting dusty and dirty from all that vinyl. And you know what I do increasingly these days? Because I know that it's hard times for these people. Not to exploit them, really. Like but Queen? like Queen? <laughs> no, I just mean like. Brian May's struggling these days. <laughs> who? Brian May. Um, from Queen. No, not Queen. They're okay. Um, but haggling with the store owners. Oh, uh, okay. You know what I mean? I don't get into many uh, haggling matches at record stores. I either buy, like, of course, if there's like a new vinyl out, it's obviously it's brand new, you buy that. But it is fun, like, to, to what Clint's saying, um, that quest to find something, whether and even if you're not looking for something in uh, particular, to go to that used bin where everything's like less than five bucks. Right. And you find something like three. I remember there's this artist, uh, older artist, which you definitely get into, named Roberta Flack. Hmm. And she's this bitchin' kind of jazz soul singer. And I hadn't really heard much of her music. I just knew her name. And I was at this great shop in Nashville. It's only open on the weekends called Phonolux a couple years back. And I found two of her records in the under $3 bin in great shape. And they're fucking awesome records. Mm. Um, so, yeah, that's a great part of vinyl is just like flipping through, maybe finding something that the cover pops out at you like, whoa, yeah. this looks rad. It's worth three bucks to check it out. Right. You might you might find your new favorite band. One of my new jams too is, um, you know, because these people who run these shops, they're obviously doing it for the love of the music. Mm-hmm. They're not they're not getting rich doing it. And I'll hear I'll, whatever they're playing up there. If I really like it, I'm like, what is this? And usually that record's for sale. I brought the I bought this uh, Proco Proco Harem record. Okay, you ever heard of this band, the '60s mm-hmm. band? No. Um, uh, Robert Trower was a guitar player. Okay. Anyway, it was just this is just real kind of cool sixty yeah. sounding rock shit. I bought that off the now playing yeah, thing. That's awesome. I bought a Booker T. Jones record that way just because it cool. was just like this. We have a record player on our bus. It was like this would be great to just jam on the bus. Yeah, that's that's like such out of the uh, that scene from uh, High Fidelity where he goes, "I will now sell the beta five b- copies of the Beta Bands three EPs." And the song starts playing. The guy goes, "Hey man, what is this?" He goes, "It's the Beta Band." He goes, "It's good." He goes, "I know, I know." I know. Uh, yeah. yeah, but no, that's great. You, like walk into records. That's so old, old, like we consider old school, like walk in, man, this sounds cool. What is this? Well, we've kind of talked about the dangers of how the new platforms of streaming music is devaluing the art form. We've yeah. talked at length about that. And it seems like one of the biggest, um, one of the reasons that people like these platforms is because it's highly uh, curates for them a listening experience. Sure, yeah. Because it takes all these algorithms of what... You listen to Stevie Nicks Belladonna this many minutes. We recommend whatever, Lana Del Rey. Yeah. Um, and I've been saying on uh, 
Twitter recently, I'm like, you know, p- people have been saying like, this is how I discover artists. What would I do without Spotify? It's like right. people discovered artists before Spotify, before there were platforms right. that literally actively devalued music and yeah. made uh, people like you and I an endangered species. Yeah. Before that, you could walk into a record store and the guy behind the counter could curate for you an experience. Yeah. Or you walk in, you look at the new release board. Right. And you're like, you, you know, there's a couple of bands you know. You're like, oh, the new whatever, Green Day. Right. And then you're like, what is that record? Or listening stations. You go into a record store and there was like. You could try them there's out. There's like, here's these 10 new records that came out this month. Listen to them. See if you like it. And that's, I mean, I discovered artists that way. I worked at a couple of record stores, independent. They were CD stores. Right. But I worked at two of them. And they would do staff picks. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. if so if, if I had, I had as I'm sure some of our listeners can imagine, I had a certain flavor when I was a 17-year-old music lover working yeah. in a CD store. Con- not quite like Barry from High Fidelity, but snobby <laughs> and, you know, elitist maybe. We're sonic fucking death monkey. But the people who trusted me, if I had my staff picks out there, if it was like Radiohead Kid A, yeah. which was the new record that year, 2001, or Perfect Circle, Merida Nam, or that new Beatles number one, or some old Elliot Smith. Yeah. Or what? Or what? Uh, the Flaming Lips, those Shimmy Battles of Pink Robots. You could curate for listeners. Yeah. Or someone come to the counter buying a Bob Dylan record, and you could go, hey, you ever checked out Woody Guthrie? Yeah, exactly. That's yeah. who Bob Dylan listened to. That's right. why yeah. he's Bob Dylan. Yes. It, it, those things happen. And, and to, it, to me, it feels so um, tangibly connected to physical media, vinyl, mm, yeah. going into stores, talking to actual people. Right, yeah. And of course, you know, Spotify, things like that, uh, Apple Music, whatever, <clears throat> is very convenient. It's cool. It's, I mean, I, I, it is I, I use Spotify, I have it, you know, I don't rely on it necessarily, like, well, I'm just going to only listen to this, like, I'm not going to delete all the music off my phone, I'm not going to uh, sell all my vinyl, uh, probably got rid, I'm going to get rid of all my CDs, but um, either way, yeah, you can discover new artists on Spotify, Um but you're going to have to click on a lot of stuff to see related artists and anything on their front page that's like, check this out. It's all like what's very popular. Maybe what that record label is paying Spotify a shitload of money Absolutely. to, it's to not, highlight. The, the it's out, not like an independent. I totally agree. Like you're not going to, when I put out my record in like a couple of months, you're not going to see my record on the front page of Spotify. It's just not going to happen. The, the curation experience in the AdSense world where, where, Google records everything you've searched. You know what I mean right, when I say yeah. the AdSense world. Yeah, um, it to me is a, it's speculative because corporations are paying to push shit to the top of that. Right, yeah. and your algorithms are all contaminated with product placement and mm-hmm. labels who are pushing their own artists. A guy in a record store, <laughs> you know, with his pull with his. Dungeons and Dragon shirt tucked into his umbros <laughs> or his Jenkins has no agenda. No, other he, than to he's just, just turn excited about up, music, you know, like exactly. Like, well, like, I mean, I've had numerous conversations with uh, the youngsters, um, where like someone you know I might run into or randomly talk to at a coffee shop or whatever. Uh, hey, I like your Clash shirt, whatever. We talk about the Clash, like, oh, well, did you hear Joe Strummer's old band before that? The one on they're fucking awesome, mm. but then. My thing I've always done, I've always said to people, and I still do to this day, is like, whatever your favorite band is, let's let's say Metallica, for instance. It's just popped I wonder in my, if any of our listeners like the band I'm Metallica. Not, I'm not really sure, but it's popped in my head. Um, you know, obviously, like, they've been very vocal about being, huge, uh, you know, immensely influenced by the new wave of British heavy metal. Right. Well, cool. Let's go listen to Judas Priest. Let's Absolutely. go listen to these Venom and Absolutely. all these bands. And then take bands like Venom. What were they influenced by? Totally. It's it's such a fun journey to go on as a music lover to find out even the fucking Beatles. Absolutely. Like find out what Paul McCartney was into when the Beatles were writing the, some of the best songs of our fucking life. You well, know? yeah, that's how I got to Buck Owens. I got to Buck Owens from the Beatles, which right, yeah. which Ringo covered act naturally. And that'll even getting into Buck Owens to your exact point will lead you down this whole other strange. Um, path because Buck Owens wasn't Southern America. He was in Bakersfield. Yeah, California. So he yeah. was in California. He was an actor, and so that that's its own brand. Buck Owens, the actor, the actor. <laughs> <laughs> Buck Owens, the actor. Well, and like when I look around at my peers and my friends, even my younger artist friends that I work or write with, it doesn't seem to me that they're that much more diverse than anyone else. Right. It's not like. Oh, I can really see how Spotify curating this mass that's they discover all these new artists they never would have heard of. Right. They still kinda like their same fifteen bands and artists. Yes, yeah, totally. 
it's still kind of homogenous. Yeah. And you still have to seek out your own shit. Of course. And yeah. have and take chances. Yes. And the thing is, the more detailed they are in their curation experience where they're like we incisively know that if you listen to this Elliott Smith record this much and this Rufus Wainwright record, you're going to like this one Ray LaMontagne song. Yeah. Then you're not taking chances, right? They're t- they're, they're, that's they're, that's they're, the yeah. opposite of taking chances. Right. That's the opposite of being being surprised by something. Right. When they're just basically tailoring everything to what they spy on you about. Yeah. Oh, oh, the, gov- the government's going to get you. Uh, that was our first email. <laughs> And now, email number two. Thank you, uh, Danny Santana. Thanks, Danny. No relation. Eric Dallager writes, Hey now, which I always hear that in the uh, Hank Kingsley. Hey now, hey now. I don't hear the Don't Dream It's Over. I just did. Um, I hear I hear the Larry Sanders show. Hey now. Hey now. Hank Kingsley. Are you familiar with the Larry Sanders show? Gary Shandling's yes. oh, yeah, yeah, no, masterpiece, no, yeah, yeah, HBO. Yeah, Gary okay. Shandling was amazing. Hey now. He says, while watching a recent YouTube video, the Meet the Laureates 2018, this was the polar prize thing that Lars won. Right, yeah. He says, uh, quite a few topics were covered in great detail, one of which was the buy request tour that ran from March to August of 2014. Being the statistics guy that he is, Lars is proud to say that he knows that Master of Puppets is the most popular Metallica song in each country from that tour. Therefore, he knows what current fans do and do not prefer, my words, not his. He says, the way in which Lars spoke in detail of those shows, as well as other topics during this interview gave the feeling that there was a hidden agenda to this by request concept to poll fans to find out what they truly wanted and expected from the next Metallica album. I thought that was very interesting. Very interesting, yeah. He says, I just think it's a little bit funny how this was right at the start of the Hardwired album production and the debut of Lords of Summer, which may have also been part of the design to gauge fan reaction to new material and subliminally nudge fans' minds into the direction of, quote-unquote, new Metallica, uh, and I get to tell them what and how to play. He says, I'm always thinking of metallic conspiracies, <laughs> but this one actually seems super plausible. And he says, I swear I have enough of these to warrant a conspiracy corner for the show, <gasps> to which I say, let's do it. Conspiracy corner? So to Eric, our friend Eric, I say this, come up with your top five metallic conspiracies, mm. and we will make that a segment of the show. I'll even write a fucking black metal jingle for it. Ooh, that'd be a good one. Um, to his point of them testing the waters, doing the by request tour to gauge what fans... I think that sounds pretty plausible. Of, yeah, for sure. I mean, like, when you're in a band uh, and you write, you have a new song, you haven't recorded it yet, or you're in the middle of recording something... Um, you're kind of always doing that. You're yeah, testing the waters. It's fun to test the waters and play that song live and see what reaction it gets. Now, you're going to play that song and you might get a good reaction, you feel good about it, but you're not going to get the reaction that Master of Puppets does or mm-hmm. that one does or right. whatever. Um but it's, it is a way to be like, or especially if you're changing your sound a little bit and you play something live and it's like, man, that did not go over well. Let's kind of rethink this new direction or something. And you're not necessarily like, like, I don't think Metallica wrote Hardwired to like, just please their fans. Like, I think they, I think those dudes back that record hundred percent. Yeah. They're not like, yeah, we, that's our sellout record. We wrote it for the fans to like bring back the old school fans, blah, blah, blah. I don't think they did that. But in, in a weird climate where people don't buy records anymore. And Lars being the sort of fastidious, business-minded yeah. dude that he is, was that them taking a pulse on what might and might not work? I think so. Because It's the, plausible. From, from what I understand about the By Request tour is that it was largely a failure because most people requested their most popular songs. Right. So the, all these, like, all these um, avenues for deep cuts didn't really happen. Yeah, you got a few. Like you got the Unforgiven twos and right, Carpe Diem baby. Some some shit happened. They may have thrown that stuff in on their own too. Like, hey, here's what the most requested stuff was tonight for Dallas, and it's like basically their greatest hits. Yeah, and then they might have been sitting there on the set list going, all right, let's throw in you know Harvester of Sorrow, let's throw in whatever you know. I think Um, for the most part, the most requested songs on the By Request tour were there were Sabbath True and Sandman Sandman and Nothing Else Matters and shit like that. Yeah. So, which is pretty Sweet depressing. Sweet Ember, totally. <laughs> totally purify. Yeah, yeah exactly. The, all of the side B of Lulu. <laughs> the best um, Anyway, that's interesting. Thanks for the email, Eric Dallager. Dallager. Eric Dallager. Dallager. That's okay. how I say his name. Oh. Dallager. 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 Anyways, whatever. That's not funny at all. Uh, <laughs> next email is from Joby. Johanna. Johanna. Is it Yobi? 
Well, she doesn't like to be called Joanna. Well, you already did it, so I called her Johanna. Sorry, that's true. Much more endearing. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna say Yo. Be. Johanna be reading this email. Yo, <laughs> zinger. Uh, oh, my comedy just says, gets better. And what's better. up, brothers? I want to drop you guys a note to tell you about a Metallica cover band I saw playing Brooklyn. They're called Fade to Black from Baltimore, and they were fucking phenomenal. They played meticulously and threw out some Easter eggs for the diehard uh, the diehards. Um, how I'm fucking you in puppets, for example, uh, but also brought their own personalities and flavor to the songs. I hung around like a creep afterwards to thank them and made sure to plug me up your podcast. So well, that's nice. very nice. Thank cool. you. We would love to have guys like that on the show sometime. Absolutely. Yeah. Just get their story of how they, you know, clearly they're Metallica fans. If you are a in a Metallica tribute band or you have friends who are, send us an email, metal podcast show at gmail.com and yeah. let us know. Yeah. That would be awesome. Yeah. Um, and maybe you could play our pre-party for the January Nashville show. We might be looking to book a Metallica tribute maybe band Maybe there's going to be like 10 Metallica cover bands that are going to email us tomorrow, and we're going to have to hold a contest, a battle of the bands. I like it already. Oh my gosh. My, the, the gears are turning right now in our I know. Heads. We're, we're wow. just producing the future right wow. now. Wow. Okay. Anyways, let's not get too sidetracked here. Okay. Uh, anyways, uh, she goes on to say, since I barely have any friends who share my pure and deep love for the boys... Uh, I went to the show alone and felt wonderfully, uh, wonderful solidarity with the other attendees who fist bumped to every beat and sang along at the top of their lungs. I imagine you two had been there uh, right, along, right along with us and felt so thankful for this little community you've built over the past year. The end. Oh, that's nice. Um, I know that feeling. I've definitely gone to shows alone before, mm-hmm. um, cover band or not, whatever, like an artist I like. Nobody I know really likes that person or that band. And I'm like, I'm just going to go check it out. And you know, I like their records. Let's see how it is live. And I'm sitting there going, where the fuck are all my friends? This is awesome. So I'm glad that, uh, Yobi, um, <laughs> had a great experience at this, you know, Metallica cover night in yeah. Bro- Brooklyn. Well, even if you're not like super jovial and like not becoming personal friends with everyone around you, right? there is the sense of I'm here with my people. Of course. Yeah. Absolutely. That's pretty cool. I mean, I've gone to like in Nashville, there's not really much of a sky reggae thing, uh, if you will. Um, I'm trying to change that with my record, of course, but I've got like random, like old school ska bands or whatever have come through Nashville and like I'll straight up pretty much just me and my old friend, Dan, who played trombone in my old band, him and I will basically go and we don't know anybody there, but like once that band starts playing, we all look at each other like, fuck yeah, like we love this music and this band and this song, whatever. There's that camaraderie in the room that like everyone's there for the same reason, you know, especially a, such a specific band like a Metallica or like right. whatever band I would go see. No one's there casually just to be like, yeah, I'm just going to grab a beer and hopefully I hear something I like. like right. If you're there for Metallica songs and this is cover band, you're fucking there for Metallica right. songs. So, yeah, it's just cool to go to a show by yourself and then still feel welcomed and feel yeah. part of a community. Like you're part of something. Exactly. Cool. Thanks, uh, Joe B. Joe B. Gary DePena says, hey, Clint Ethan, I just stumbled upon your podcast a few weeks back while searching Newstead on Spotify to give his album my monthly listen which, in my opinion, is pretty badass. Is he saying the album's badass, or that the process of him I think trying the, to find it and finding us? I think the is process badass. of searching for news and finding us was badass. Yeah. Okay. Cool. We'll, we'll go with that. He says, "I scrolled down and saw your episode dedicated to Jason, and couldn't click it fast enough. You guys were spot on about why I think he's so beloved by us fans. He brought a power and a ferocity that just fit perfectly with what the band needed at the time." in place to keep them going in that upward traje- trajectory. Rot row. You everything cool? I just spilled. Fumble. I spilled a drink. If we there were wasn't both into left. sports, I would say fumble and then a team that you liked a lot. Dodgers? Yeah. Yeah. The, error on the Dodgers. Error, yeah. <laughs> Not fumble. No, I just spilled a little bit of vodka on the floor. Do you but need it, to retouch? A, nah, it's fine. Okay. Um, he says, since then, I've gone back and binged in the last 30 episodes. But tag along weekly as you guys release newer ones. I found a video I thought was relevant with the James Guitar theme episode you just did with Brad, meaning Brad Lyons, right. from Single Podcast Theory. He says, and I wanted to share it with you guys. James goes into how him and Kirk went to watch Iron Maiden and Queen on the days they had off last summer during the World Wired Tour. In the video, James mentions how they both totally geek out at being able to hold and play Brian May's guitar, uh, his original guitar from Queen. And we actually have a clip of that that we're going to play right now. So let's dip into that. And also when you listen to this, James talks about this original guitar he built with his dad, but it's a really cool story. If you can dig deeper with Queen, 
the famous guitar that Brian made from Queen play is like him and his dad built it when he was 18 years old. Mm -hmm. There's not one like in the world. There's replicas and stuff, but it's a truly really cool story about a guitar and which essentially made the Brian May sound. Exactly. So check out this clip. You know, Queen has been a huge inspiration in the early days for me, guitar wise, especially Brian May. But we're just watching Brian May. And there was a moment in the show where, I mean, Bohemian, Bohemian Rhapsody, it was like this rock and roll dream I was looking at. I was right on, I was right at the sound desk, looking out at him, long, long ramp, he came, popped out of the middle just before his solo. There's smoke, there's a light behind him and his white hair, this big white you know, aura around him and he rises up out of the stage and he's doing the solo and he's in this giant silver cape you know, from like the 70s look. And Kirk and I just looked at each other like, holy shit, this is awesome. You know, total fanboys at that point. And then after the show, um, <laughs> Brian May, and he says, I'm, I'm wondering if Kirk likes what I'm playing. <laughs> and Kirk and I look at each other again like, huh? <laughs> yeah, Brian May just said that. Uh, met his roadie, we were all hanging out, and his guitar on his back, and he's, hey, I know some of your crew guys, and this and that, and, and I'm thinking, what's, what's that on your back? Is that the guitar? He says, oh yeah, uh-huh. He's like, um, okay. Is there any way possible that I can just take a look at it? He's like, oh yeah. Hey, Brian, is that okay? He's like, oh sure, yeah. So he takes it out, opens it up, and I'm jamming on Brian May's old girl, original guitar that him and his dad made when he was 18 years old. And he still has it on tour, and he still plays it every night. It was spectacular. And then Brian leans over me, and he's taking selfies. Hey! Like, oh my god. Couldn't wipe the smile off my face. I, I'm, it was extremely cool. So, And then Kirk's like, my turn, my turn. You know, okay, here you go. So we all got to play Brian's guitar. Just a super, super memorable and... Uh, redundantly unforgettable moment. Hopefully, if I'm alive at 70, I'm that cool and that down to earth and that uh, just giving and loving life. He's so serene. Um, he's a yeah, big inspiration as far as all that goes. Very cool. Oh man, that's so cool. He says, I wonder if that guitar ever came up for grabs, who would win the ultimate battle to death between James and Kirk, since we know Kirk is also a huge guitar collector. Always cool to hear stories of two guys who we all look up to still acting like kids in a candy shop around the guys they look up to. Yeah. That's what we were almost even talking about earlier with the vinyls. Like, yeah. our heroes have heroes. Of course. And if you trace the thread, that's how you discover cool shit. Very cool shit, yeah. Uh, he says, P.S. I'm actually from the real New Jersey, a few towns over from Hoboken, which one of you guys surprisingly mentioned before. Please add me to the long list of fellow Metallica fans to chop it up with you over some grub and beers if either of you are ever in the area. Peace. Peace. Well, oh, needless to Hoboken. say, we certainly will. Whenever we're traveling, we try to let people know where we're going. Yeah. And um, I've been through Hoboken. The main... I've been to Hoboken. The main thing I know about Hoboken is one of my... Probably in my top 10 favorite bands of all time, an Australian band called The Living End. They recorded one of their records in Hoboken. Mm. I think it was the record called White Noise. Awesome record. Anyways. I know that Artie Lang lives there. That's <laughs> from the Stern Show. In Hoboken, New Jersey, New Jersey. Which is in the New Jersey Peninsula yeah. of s Southern New Jersey? Uh, I think it's East New Jersey. Oh, right, right. Yeah. right. Yeah. East of New Jersey, west of New Jersey. Exactly. But also in New Jersey. Well, of course. Yeah. How could it, it not it be? It has to be. How yeah. could it not be? <laughs> All right. Next email is from Brian King. Hey, Clinton Ethan. Every Monday, I intend on commenting about how much I enjoy every episode, but life distracts me. And before I know it, another episode drops. So I'll keep it short and sweet. In regards to Melody Podcast Radio Part 3, Clint, uh, please record a formal solo album. Uh, your material is so well crafted and I love your voice. This is so sweet. Aww. Aww. Um, I would get, uh, get behind any crowdfunding that you do. You must do this. Uh, on a side note, I was instantly inspired to write. And on the other hand, I was humiliated that I never, uh, 
uh, write songs is wonderful. Oh, sorry, write songs. Is, sorry, let me, let me do that again. I was humiliated that I never write songs as wonderful. Looking forward to Ethan Ethan Luck on vinyl. Paul Muck rocks. Uh, I'm going to pause real quick and agree with Brian King that I've told Clint this for a long time now that he needs to do a fucking record. Mm-hmm. He's got like 800,000 songs mm-hmm. over on uh, SoundCloud and they're all just really good songs. I think Clint needs to narrow it down. We might do it. I'll play on it for free. The thing is, you can go to my SoundCloud and download like 100 songs for free. Yes. They're my demos. Right, but I, here's what I think everyone wants to hear. Everyone wants to hear a Clint Wills solo record produced by... Paul? Paul? Paul. Come out. <laughs> I would love to hear that. I would love to hear a Clint Wills solo record, 10 tracks, 12 tracks, something like that, in the smokestack. I know. The only thing that's going to keep me from it, for real, is I want to do a Lunar Satan record with Paul. <laughs> Which kind of would be a Clint Wells record. It would be, yeah. But the Lunar Satan stuff to me is so exciting. It is exciting, but I'm just telling you from an outsider's perspective, the stuff you have on SoundCloud is really good. Yeah, it's well, thank it's you. really great. There's really great songwriting there. Great. Yeah, I know they're just demos, but mm-hmm. like they're great fucking songs. And so I'm on Team Brian here. That okay. I want to. You know, what? I'll pitch in twenty bucks to that crowdfunding platform. Okay. You hear it first. <laughs> That's all we need. You've already made twenty bucks, <laughs> Paul. Paul. <laughs> Will you do the record for 20 bucks? <laughs> Anyways, Brian goes on to say, uh, Paul Muck rocks. Uh, perhaps have Paul on and talk about the difference, sorry, the different recording techniques Metallica has used over the years. From splicing tape, compiling drum fills on the Black Album, to aligning the drums on the grid on the newer albums, LOL. Let's have a more in-depth production convo about the albums. We can definitely do that. Um, yeah, I think he'd be up for it too, oh, yeah. for sure. Uh, and thanks again for including uh, our track on Mobile Podcast Radio 2. This is from Brian King, who is, of, of course, in this band that we've fallen in love with called Reality Suite. We and supported Clint- their uh, pledge campaign. Yeah, twice. <laughs> they've, got a, they've got a new EP out that's really cool. Yeah. It's just great modern hard rock music. That, yeah, they're awesome. They're a hardworking band, too. They work hard. They're based out of, they are based out of Jersey. Yeah. And uh, female, female front person. She's got a great voice. Great voice. Great hooks. Super you know. hot drummer. Yeah, we're going to get the reality suite uh, Brian King edition of the um, of the calendar the calendar edition. This is Brian King as a fireman. Exactly. This is Brian King as a policeman. This is Brian King washing an old eighties Trans Am. This is Brian King on piggyback riding with David Hasselhoff <laughs> on the on the Jersey Shore. <laughs> <laughs> this is Brian King just like posing on the boardwalk in Atlantic City. This is Brian King uh, disassembling and reassembling a motorcycle on the beach. Sweaty. This is Brian King at sunset. <laughs> this is Brian King uh, playing some su- some slots with the boys in Atlantic City. This is Brian Jersey. King during pornography. <laughs> <laughs> during pornography. <laughs> what does that mean? It's in the middle of it. It's in the middle of it. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Brian, for the kind words. We really appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, thank you. And everyone go check out Reality Suite. Great Reality band. Suite's an awesome band. Go yeah. check them out. St. Matthew is their last email. Writes, what the fuck? How did it take me so long to listen to episode 80, the best and worst songs with single podcast theory? He says, literally my favorite episode of the whole podcast. Wow. I'm just so happy to have you two in your pockets in my life. Godspeed and peace. Well, thank you, St. Matthew, for the short and sweet, wow. very kind words. Very kind words. We are really grateful for all of you out there who listen. We feel like we're a part of something bigger than ourselves. Yeah, it is. We're as glad to be on the ride as you are. And having said that, it's that easy. If you want to have your thing right on the show, send us an email. Metal up your podcast show at gmail.com. Let's get the fuck out of here. Uh, let's get out. Hey, this is Ethan and Clint from Metal Up Your Podcast, and we want to talk to you about something we love called Patreon. That's right. Patreon is a way for fans of the show to give back to the show to donate money that uh, helps us in quality and content. And not only that, but we've actually come up with all sorts of fun incentives to give back to you for supporting the show. Exactly. For instance, if you donate $5 or more, you get access to Cover Our World Blackened, which is the official Metal Up Your Podcast Metallica cover EP. That's right, and that's the only way to get it. In addition to the EP, we also give you priority email access, meaning we'll read your email first on the show. We give you early access to Patreon-exclusive merchandise, Patreon-exclusive giveaways, and any other side projects that Ethan and I might be involved in. There's all sorts of things you can look at on there and you can donate to. Go check it out. 
patreon.com slash metal up your podcast. How do you spell that, Clint? P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash metal up your podcast. And if you really think about it, $5 a month for an entire year, that's really just like a cup of coffee a month. So go check it out. Thanks, everyone. Peace. Adios. All right. 1987. Well, it was 1987. <laughs> the year was 1987. Are we doing the Ken Burns version? The year. In a world... <sighs> When 1986 is obliviated, 1988 is yet to come. One band. One band. Two bass players. Two bass players. Conquer 1987, and not much happened that year. (laughs) One band, one wrist, one EP. One One skateboard accident. One home video. A couple shows, and Bon Jovi. (laughs) Well, let's get into 19... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Let's get into 1987. Now, the, an interesting thing is the, the year for them really does start with quite a bit of shows. Yeah. When Cliff passed away, Cliff was killed by the bus accident, they had all this European dates already planned out that right, they yeah. basically had to cancel. So um, they spent January 8th through February 13th basically doing the makeup shows. Yeah. And, you know, Jason had already, of course, what we covered in 1986, auditioned, got in the band, did those few quick like introduction shows yeah where they opened for metal church right yeah and then he went and did the five dates in japan yeah budokan he talks about yeah and then uh so you know he had a few months here to really go out and slog it out on a metallica headlining tour right yeah with metal church and support right did anthrax do some of these dates uh, everything i looked up was was showing that like metallica and i'm sorry uh metal church and anthrax okay they were, were they were on every show that's what I saw. Okay, cool. Um, I, there, there's a there, you know you know there's like like sub Wikipedia pages like somethingpedia yeah. or whatever, like I, I like found Wiki like, fan and shit, something like that. Yeah, Wiki fan something. I, f- I came across one that was all about Metallica tours, and I was going through all this stuff from 1987, and I found January 8th through February 13th. It was still basically the continuation of the Damage Inc. tour, right? Which or Damage was Justice, which sorry. which was Anthrax, right? They were and, on the road, and with so them. it was showing like Metal Church and Anthrax. There was no s- specifics like. They did everything but Nebraska or right, whatever. Right, you know? right, so right, right. We'll just lump that in there. Um, so, you know, that was good for Jason, I imagine. Like, when I think about new guy in the band, of course, the, the insanity of uh, the audition process and then doing those dates in Japan, huge right. festivals in Japan. So that comes down and it's kind of back to normal European clubs headlining. That's a good education in those yeah. few months. Of course, this is probably largely where much of the hazing that we've right, heard yeah. of was happening. I wonder, them, them coming to his room late at night and pulling the mattress off yeah. the bed and charging drinks to his room, yeah. and the wasabi shit and all that. You know? I, I do wonder, because at this point, I'm sorry, backing up, at the point before Cliff died, Metallica had a really good buzz in Europe. Yes. And these fans were so excited to see this band, and then all right. of a sudden tragedy struck, they had to cancel. I wonder how a lot of these European fans felt when Metallica came back through finally in January and there's a new bass player, mm-hmm. and it's like, of course, there's you're still stoked to go see your band. They're coming back, honoring their word. They're going to make up these shows. We're coming back. It was probably a let's let's see how he does vibe. Right? Yeah. Maybe because yeah, it's true. You would think there might be like a um, underdog vibe of like we're on board, he, whatever we, we it is. We, but it probably was kind of an arms yeah across. Like let's see what he bring the heat that he can bring. You know? Yeah, exactly. Which, as we know, he he brought the heat. Well, I mean, it's we've talked about it so much, but just what a perfect dude to come in and do that gig because Metallica was his favorite band. Right. His spirit, so as one of the emails mentioned before, his spirit was so pure and right. He lived and breathed Metallica, yeah. and he loved Cliff so much. Right, exactly. And yet he wasn't, and I, I find this more and more respectable about Jason, and yet he wasn't just a Cliff Burton clone. Oh no, he didn't show up in like all denim and then like he had a whole different deal. A whole different deal. He played differently. He played with a pick. Yep. He played different bases. Uh, he wrote differently. Yeah, you know, like he brought he brought the spirit and the um, reverence. Yeah, for puppets and earlier. Right. With his own deal. If you want to listen to a band that just like replaces somebody and tries to make it sound like exactly like the original, just go listen to Journey. Right. Totally. That's basically what it is. Like, let's find a guy on YouTube that sounds like Steve Perry. Right. And, and is it that guy f- even named Steve? I have no idea. That I think, Asian I think dude. He, I think he's. I think he's Thai. There's a documentary about him on Netflix. Actually, it's pretty interesting. Yeah. Either way, he's there to sound like Steve Perry. Right. Jason Newstead wasn't there to sound like Cliff. He was there to 
take, you know, jump into Cliff's shoes, take on that role. But he brought Jason with him. Yeah. He, he didn't g- jump in that gig going like, all right, I got to wear get some bell bottoms and a denim jacket and totally. a misfit shirt. Right. And play an area pro a two misfit tattoo on my right shoulder. Exactly. You know, he, he came in and honored Cliff and respected Cliff and the legacy that Cliff had built off three records, but then also brought in his own thing. Yeah, I appreciate and that's, that. And that's him. why we love him. Yeah, I agree. So that's kind of what they were up to. Now, uh, at the end of February, so I imagine the boys get off the road February 13th, still grieving Cl- Cl- Cliff's death. Of course, yeah. Been less than a year. There's, as Lars once uh, poetically described, they had jumped to the bottom of a bottle of vodka and stayed there for years. I imagine during this off time... It was no different. And on March 26, James breaks his goddamn wrist Again. skateboarding for the second time. As we all know, if you've been doing your homework on our 1986 episode, in July of 86, while they were on tour with Ozzy, James broke his wrist skateboarding. John Marshall filled in. It was July through September. That's a long time. Yeah. James plays his first show back with his guitar the day before Cliff passes away. Right, yeah. So this motherfucker is just still getting on, playing with death here. Well, and let's be honest, he's probably not sober while yeah, getting right. on a skateboard, which what is I, not easy, by the way. What I found, what right? Because you, you, you grew I up. Skate. Did you grow up skating? And you, uh, yeah, you still oh, yeah. skate? Yeah, yeah I, I still skate. Yeah, I'm not like good. I just cruise. It's not really a, a recreational gig where you can kind of be fucked up while doing it, right? Y- yeah, I've definitely had moments like on tour, like like when I was still touring with Kings, I'd always bring my skateboard on tour and throw it in the bay of the bus. So after the show, in like an amphitheater, there's a bunch of asphalt area for miles. Mm-hmm. And I would just cruise and skate and stuff like that. But there was nights where like we'd all be having fun, like grilling out by the buses, like drinking, having fun. And of course, I'm like, I'm going to get on my skateboard. There was one night where the semi trucks were like packing up all the stuff that like lighting and all that stuff and video. And we were, me and the, the backline guys were already done. And I was kind of skating around this park. I remember it was in San Diego. And I see the semi trucks start pulling out. And what do I do after a few drinks? I skate behind the semi truck and grab onto the back of it. Oh, Back to the Future style. Start, start skitching. Yeah, yeah. Oh, is that called skitching? Skitching. Yeah, that's what we called it in California. <laughs> but um, everybody that was over, like by the barbecue, was looking at me like you fucking idiot. We know you've been drinking, and I'm just like, this is the best. Everything was fine. However, that's the power of love. Exactly. Was that with the Huey Lewis playing in totally. the background? I mean, we went by this like. Um, this workout place, there were a bunch of ladies doing aerobics and I waved at them. Mm-hmm. Just like the movie, it was great. Yeah. Cool. yeah and, then, and then I got a four by four. Save me, the clock tower. Me and Jennifer went up to the lake, threw a couple of sleeping bags in the back. Totally, yeah. yeah. Anyways, I get it though. Like skating is so fun. James grew up in California. That's that's a big part of the culture out there when you grow up as a kid. Skateboarding is, it's, it's what they originally called sidewalk surfing. Like everybody at some point tries it. James clearly did growing up in Downey. And he talks about, and it's really true, the boredom of the road. I mean, you, yeah. there's not much to do, and you should do something. And he actually even say, he actually even says, he's quoted as saying, uh, I was drinking less, so this was something to do instead of drink. So it's kind of mellowed me out, right. which I find ironic. What I didn't know is that he did it, he was like, I guess, what do you call that? Doing a half pipe in an empty swimming pool. Yeah, I mean, it's... It's not really a half pipe, but it's like a... It's, it's the like same a idea. Poor though, man's yeah. half pipe. Yeah. But he was hanging out with, in Oakland, with Kirk, Fred Cotton, who was their friend that was singing Spastic Children. Right. And Pusshead. Yeah. Just hanging, skating in an empty pool, probably yeah. drinking a lot of Heineken or Coors Light. And um, what I found interesting about this, too, is because of this injury, they had to cancel an appearance on Saturday Night Live. Which is insane. Can you imagine? They would have played, what, Master of Puppets? Master of Puppets and Sanitarium? Which is, which is 10 minutes long. They would have done a TV version. They probably right? would have done, I think they would have maybe done Hit the Lights and Master, or or maybe Fade to Black. Gosh, maybe, I mean. Or Bells. It, it, what's crazy is like. What are the two songs they would have done? <sighs> it's so weird to think about. I mean, nowadays on SNL, like people do like their current single and one other from the new record. If you're doing an old song on SNL, it's because you're maybe a, a bit of a legacy act or something like that. Yeah, but they were such but an underground. They were. It shocks me that they even got asked to do SNL. And it's it's kind of a big bummer that they couldn't do that. They I would mean, have been the heaviest band at that time to play SNL. Absolutely, for sure. Your current record is Master of Puppets. I know they did it. They did Memory Remains. I know they did it during the Load Reload era, right? Which did, wasn't the best. No, Marianne Fa- Faithful sings off key the whole yeah. time. Did they do a Black Album era? Uh, SNL? I don't believe so, but I can look it up while we're discussing this. Uh, don't this. look it up. No, don't look it up. I don't care. 
We're going to get to it. We're going to do a whole episode on this stuff. Okay, fine. I mean, you can if you want to. Okay, fine. Grab my phone again. All right. Well, Ethan's going to look this up. So we're going to do SNL, which I, f- I find very bizarre. It-, it seems to me, now that we have the benefit of hindsight, that them being on SNL in summer of 87 is t- way too soon. Oh, yeah. Way too soon. Way too them- soon. Way too soon for them to do SNL. It, by the way, it seems like the first time they played SNL was 97. So that would have been Memory Remains. Right. What's the second song they did? Um, Fuel? Mary Faithful. It is season 23, December 6th, 97. Wow, they didn't do anything during the Black Album. That's insane. I could see them doing Inner Sam. Nathan, Nathan Lane was the host. Love him. Nathan Lane? Who's that? Nathan Lane? Yeah, who is that? Uh, Nathan Lane, uh, one of the, my favorite movies ever with Robin Williams, The Birdcage. Oh yeah, The Birdcage. Yeah, he's his, his partner. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. gotcha. Um, he often does appearances on Modern Family as the character Pepper. He's the, amazing. The Birdcage is a great movie. Great movie. Great, great, great movie. That's the best one where he's teaching him how to walk manly. Yeah. Cause he's trying to, he's trying to fool the, trying to the fool in-laws. The in-laws that he's which straight. Which is Gene Hackman and Diane Weiss. And they, uh, oh, Diane Weiss is so great. She's so good. But what they, a great te- what movie mom. But they end up uh, changing the apartment decor and right, make yeah, it to make it less straight. gay and yeah, stuff. Yeah. And, but my favorite part in the birdcage is when he, Rob Williams is trying to teach Nathan Lane how to walk manlier and he does this awkward, super weird walk and he turns around and Nathan Lane goes, he was like, something like, too much? And he goes, no, it's perfect. I just didn't realize that John Wayne walked like that. Because <laughs> he, he describes like, just picture John Wayne, like you walk into the saloon and right. blah, blah, blah. Oh, it's such a good movie if you haven't seen it. Yeah. And Hank Azaria in that movie is amazing. His yep. guy is Agador Spartacus. Yep. Oh my gosh. Um, I'm still trying to figure out what other song they played while, you're, while we're discussing this stuff. Well, so they had to cancel that, which I'm sure was a huge bummer for the entire Metallica Fuel. machine. Fuel. Okay. Yeah. Um, they so Electra even put a clause in James's contract that basically said he can't play on skateboard, can't fuck around with skateboards yeah. on tour. I've been on tour where tour managers will like say that kind of stuff, like, "Hey, if you into skateboarding, like anything that you could potentially break a bone on, like you're not doing it on this tour." Well, because you know, I guess when you look at it as dollars and cents and zeros and ones, it's it's a li- it's a liability, and it's of course you can't make the, the machine can't go if you can't fucking get on stage and do your job. Exactly. I mean, if if like it, of course it's been proven that he can break his wrist and John Marshall can come in and fill in, but still, like if someone like Lars was into skating and all of a sudden broke his wrist, it's like in the middle of a tour, it's like well. I mean, maybe drum tech guy could fill in, but nobody wants to see him. At I least mean, James was still on stage in, in, in the, the previous year with a cast on singing, you know. Obviously, my career is peanuts compared to what Metallica has accomplished, but I've had moments where I'm like, I'm not changing my own oil or putting my hand in a... I've, I've, I've declined certain things, climbing, tr- doing stupid right. shit, because I'm like, if I hurt my hands, I can't... I don't know what else I can do. Yeah, that's, that's your job. It's kind of important that I protect Your hands that part are tools man my hands are my my job those are the tools of your trade bro all right so we fast forward kind of uneventful i mean it was kind of a year off 86 was a fucking huge year dude the I'd they, imagine they're pretty they, exhausted they release puppets they go on that tour they right. tour with ozzy and then of course cliff passing away yeah getting a new bass player it makes sense that the 87 was a little more chill right so the next thing that kind of blips up on the radar so Br- james broke his wrist at the end of march the next thing that kind of happens on the radar is they begin recording uh, what would become Garage Days Re-Revisited on July 9th, which they had a gig booked, the Monsters of Rock gig at Castle Donington. Yeah. So, the, you know, the, the powers that be were like, hey, it'd be nice if we had something. Something new. Something new. Yeah. Maybe not the full length, but something new to sell, like a single. Yeah. What they wanted was a single. So... uh there was this British label Parlophone that wanted to put something out because Castle Donington, the Monsters of Rock, that's a that was in London. Um, so the recording session began on July 9th. What I do like about before they began is they were rehearsing at Lars's garage in El Cerrito, right? And Jason brought his construction background to the table by making like soundproofing Lars's garage, right, yeah. which I'm sure was kind of an important bonding stuff. Yeah, well, he's he's contributing to the band uh, other than musically. Of, yeah, exactly. Yeah, he's I, got. I would hope that would help, but I mean, they still haste him for a while. <laughs> I've been in bands before where someone you can see what they're bringing to the table, additionally music, and it does help. Like right. 
they're good with directions. They're good with packing the trailer. Yeah. They're funny. They lubricate social situations. They're good with fans. All that stuff matters even more than how you play. Yeah. I contribute with lubricating as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's my, that's my, I wouldn't call my forte, but. Is that what they call you? The lubricator? Exactly. Yeah. I've always heard of that. Ethan lubricator luck. Exactly. Yeah. It's a lot of people don't know it, but you have to go on tour with me to find out <laughs> what's happening. Oh, I don't know. Let's just say I combine that with skateboarding. That's all I'm going to say. So we've done a whole episode on Garage A's Re-Revisited. You guys can go check that out. That was What episode was that? Uh, that was 843. Do we remember how long ago that was? It was years ago. So some of the details we'll rehash here. It was recorded in six days from start to mix. Um, they needed to get this out for the Monsters of Rock. They're still grieving Cliff. They just kind of wanted to have fun, pay homage to the bands that they were influenced by, right? Right. Ethan's having a real yes. serious gravity um, problem. Well, <laughs> is there something wrong with the Earth's gravitational pull in the future? <laughs> no, I just like, I set things on my lap and I'm crossing my legs and yeah. just, I'm wearing, I'm wearing real slick shorts right now. So that everything slides off. I read this today that I did not know. So supposedly these sessions were supposed to be writing sessions for what would become justice. Yeah. But the band was, I guess, disappointed that the writing sessions didn't yield much with Jason. Yeah. All they really got was a demo for Blackened, which of course went on to be a shitty song, right? <laughs> to be a, to be, yeah. But it did go on to open up the record and be right, one, of, right. one of their most beloved songs. Yeah. But that's all they got. So with James breaking his arm, the material not really being there, uh, they just wanted to start to have fun and play covers that they already knew, right? So it was named after the subtitle, which the B-side of Creeping Death was called Garage Days Revisited, mm-hmm. yeah. where they did M.I. Evil and Blitzkrieg. Right. So, as we know, the songs were Helpless by Diamond Head, Small Hours by Holocaust, Crash Course by Budgie, Last Caress and Green Hill by The Misfits and The Weight by Killing Joke. Other songs considered were Signal Fire by Japanese band Bow Wow, and I'm No Fool by Gaskin, two songs I've never heard. By I two bands Bow I've never wow heard is of. That Little Bow Wow's dad? Little Bow Wow? Yeah, it, it, yeah. Bow Wow's big, there's Big Bow Wow, his Japanese father, who was Japanese, yeah, and right. there's Little Bow Wow, who's from Atlanta, Georgia. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> this is um, a little music history for you guys. They left the weight off of the UK version because for it to actually qualify as a quote unquote single, it had to be of a certain length, right? And they were wanting to, they were wanting it to chart and sell as a single, not as an actual EP. Yeah, but even then, it's like what six songs? You take one off, it's considered a single. Well, it was five. Or you're saying, or, 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 or was it needed it, to be four songs to be a single. Or was it was it left off the EP to promote as a single? It was left off on the UK pressings to qualify as a single. To qualify the EP as a single, right? Okay. Well, because because in the states it was an EP with the weight. Because right. Last Caress and Green Hell only counted as one song. Exactly. Yeah. So in the states it's five songs, yeah. even though technically it's six. The UK thing was four. Even though technically it was five. So that could be basically a single and three B sides kind exactly. of Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And that was all like for marketing reasons. Yeah. Um uh released by Phonogram, not Polygram, Phonogram in the UK, only on twelve inch vinyl, no C D cassette or seven inch. And it went to number twenty seven. So it was kind of a not bad. It was successful for them. Yeah. Um and then I had this uh quote that I read today. So it says in 1987, Lars Ulrich was Phonogram's go-to guy for both promotional issues and all relevant business decisions. Uh, it says, I would, the, this is like one of Phonogram's people says, I would talk to the band manager, Peter Minch, and he would say, okay, now you got to talk to Lars and persuade him. Lars was totally immersed in the business side of things. He was the guy who had to be persuaded. He would then go to the guy who was the real decision maker in the band, and that was James Hetfield on the big things. Wow. So you see sort of the hierarchy get sort of spelled oh, yeah. out here. Lars is maybe the brainier one, the guy kind of more in the weeds of it. Yeah, but who would hear James it all is out? Maybe the maybe the, the, the heart, like I'm gonna like, okay, Lars presents him with all this info, like we gotta do this, we gotta do this, we gotta do this. And James goes with his gut, maybe feels like he knows what's best for the band as a whole, and he's the he's the dad, he's the papa head. He's, well, it just seems like even if Lars sussed out all the details and decided we should do this, yeah. If James says no, it's a no. Yeah, totally. Which I find interesting. Yeah, there's no ask your mother. It's dad said no. <laughs> Daddy, yeah, yeah, totally. Hey, Papa Head, can we can can we re- release this as a single? No. No. Oh, damn it. Okay, Dad. Whatever, Dad. 
I'm gonna go be hang out with Parents just don't understand. I'm gonna go hang out with Dave Mustaine Jr. Ugh. No, you won't. <laughs> that 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 it elicited a visceral ugh for me. Yeah. Your body kind of your mannerisms change a little bit. We had a text a runner yesterday because uh we had booze on the bus with no mixers. So we texted our runner and said, Hey, this is our tour manager. He's sitting right in front of me texting this. Hey, is there anybody we can get some uh, LaCroix or some soda water to the band bus? And he read the text back. It said, ugh, UGH, I'll, se- I'll check and see. Wow. Ugh, I'll check and see. Ugh. I'm here to do a specific job. Like and- we asked for like... <laughs> Like, caviar right or you ask for like the ridiculous things you hear on bands riders like we I, yeah. we're missing a the football bowl of helmet M- full of cottage cheese right we're missing the bowl of m&ms without all the brown ones or whatever all right so fast forward to august 20th 1987 the band plays an unannounced warm-up gig billed as damage inc at the legendary uh london club called the 100 club which i've never played have you ever played that i've never played it no not to be confused with the 700 club pat robertson <laughs> Or the 900 Club. The DC Club. Oh, 930 Club. The 930 Club. Yeah. Great venue. Um, all right. So uh, what's interesting about the show, so it's just like a hot, sweaty club show. Unpromoted. They play it under a pseudonym. But this is the world premiere of Leper Messiah, The Small Hours, and The Wait. It was also the first and only performance of Crash Course and Brain Surgery. That's crazy. They've never played it since. Yeah. And this was a warm-up gig for the Monsters of Rock show, by the way. Right. Which would happen two days later. Uh, they played Help- Helpless, and Brian Tatler from Diamond Head came out and played guitar. That's awesome. fun. And there were rumors that, I guess, the bass went out during the show. And there were rumors that Jason passed out because it was so hot in this club. Yeah. He didn't pass out. But that's kind of the word that like the, the, the local rats right, were maybe putting out. Maybe at some point like uh, he wasn't using wireless and step on, someone stepped on the cable or something happened and it came unplugged for a minute. There's a million crazy things that can happen sure. where your rig goes out or maybe his amp head went out and they had, exactly. to, had a backup or something. Yeah. And um, you know what? I don't think I don't think there's a show hot enough for Jason Newstead to give up and pass out. No Not that you have a choice when you pass no out. No fucking way. But Jason Newstead would be the, probably the last one on stage. To- he would go on to say that he thought that maybe the boys even themselves planted that as a rumor as a further hazing. Yeah, it's possible. Which that, to me, that's a window into how paranoid he might have gotten. Right. Where if they're like fucking with you every turn, you're always looking over your shoulder. Yeah, any, anything that comes out about your band that's negative towards you, you would, I, I would assume would be coming from the other boys. Right. But. So they play that show on the 20th. The next day, the record comes out. Then the day after that, the 22nd, they actually play the Monsters of Rock Festival. Right. On a bill with Cinderella, Wasp, Anthrax, Dio, and Bon Jovi, who we know just a few short years earlier had the whole helicopter incident. Right. <laughs> the kill Bon Jovi. <laughs> which you got to think, like, it had to have gotten back to Bon Jovi by 1987 that James wrote Kill Bon Jovi on his For guitar. For sure. Because I think he even did, like, Guitar World Press with <laughs> press that guitar with like, on the cover. Yeah. I wonder what Bon Jovi thought about that. I mean, at, the, at this point, they're they're... Is Bon Jovi kind of laughing at that? Or is Bon Jovi going... I'll bet, I'll bet at this point they're laughing at it because it's 1987. Huge. Glam rock is fucking massive at this point, And Bon Jovi is basically at the top of the mountain. Totally. I mean, who would have been Motley Crue, maybe? But Motley Crue, I would say, probably didn't actually achieve what Bon Jovi did until, until maybe Dr. Feelgood. Well, we're... True. And, and 87 was kind of the year of Appetite for Destruction. So it wouldn't be maybe for another 18 months before Appetite unseated all right that. exactly but at this point bon jovi has released like their first uh, this is slippery when wet this is slippery when wet which was huge huge record i mean living, on a, living it, on a prayer and shit well living on that was new jersey i think right but that but that song had already by that time living yeah. on a prayer was one of the biggest songs ever yes huge you give love a bad name was a huge song exactly one and dead or alive huge song right uh runaway which that's early but that's fir- that first record yeah I often laugh about that song because at the end of the song, John Bon Jovi goes into like a really high falsetto. I can't even sing falsetto that high, but it's like a, oh, there's a man run away. I can't go that high. Yeah. But it's the funniest thing because like when you listen to it, it's like he goes, I won't do falsetto again because that was awful. But um, <laughs> it's like, Ooh, uh, he goes, ah, uh, oh, he's a little runaway. And then he just mumbles like, nah, 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 nah. listen to the song sometime. The last chorus when he does the high falsetto it's gibberish, other than the word <laughs> runaway. Let us 
it's all on Saturday. It really is. <laughs> da, 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 da. It's the weirdest shit. But a fun song. Good keys. Like, I think Bon Jovi's cool. I was just talking with my friend Patrick last night about this, or a couple nights ago. We were listening, we, for fun, we're on Spotify just pulling up some like 80s uh, hair metal ballads and stuff, like some rat Cinderella, this and that. And uh, we got to some Bon Jovi, like Always, I'll Be There oh, For I You. Oh, I love Always. I think I'll Be There For You might be one of the greatest 80s ballads ever. Dude. And we've we, sung it many times on this show. Oh, yeah. And I also think that like they were one of the few bands that survived the 90s. Because they weren't like, like they were kind of dressed up for the 80s, but they weren't like glammed out like, they didn't look like girls. Like Poison, look what the cat dragged in. They didn't look like that. They had some teased hair and stuff, but they were still at heart kind of just like blues guys Hmm. from Jersey, like blue collar, all this stuff. And when they They had a great 90s ballad called Bed of Roses. Exactly. Bed of Roses was great. I want to lay you down on a bed of roses. For the night I sleep on a bed Bed of nails. nails. Oh, I want to be just as close as the Holy Ghost. It's it's so good. It's great. I mean, and and then even fast forward to like the year 2000. In the The year 2000. You know, they did that record Crush, which had that wow, wow. In my life. It's In my life. In my life. <laughs> fucking now or never. And I ain't gonna live forever. Fucking I, I just wanna live, live my wild. fucking I'm life. It's my wow. life. <laughs> I was wow. in the, yeah, I'm into that. This is a song for the broken hearted. Wow, wow. wow. So it's kind of him trying to do man in the box, kind of. Yeah, exactly. But my point being, they survived the 90s. Yeah, Where like a totally. lot of those glam bands, once Nirvana came out, Metallica got huge. It was just like... You remember they did Living on a Prayer in 94? Oh, yeah. They did a 1994 oh, yeah. version. Side note, Bon Jovi, specifically John Bon and Richie... Richie Sambori... Basically started MTV Unplugged. From they played Wanted Dead or Alive yep. and Living on a Prayer Acoustic for yep. the MTV Music Awards. Yep. So, props to old JBJ and company. Dude, I got re- nothing but respect for them. Of course. I just have the benefit of retrospect where I'm like, I guess it was uncool or it wasn't heavy or it wasn't true or legit. I don't give a fuck Those about- are g- good songs are good songs. I don't give a fuck about yeah. that. You you Give Love a Bad Name is a great, great ass song. Dude, Blaze of Glory is a great song. Yes. Solo song. Blaze From of the Glory? Young Guns 2 soundtrack. What do you mean a solo Blaze of song? Glory. That was a John Bon Jovi solo song. What? No. Yeah. Uh-huh. It sounds just like Bon Jovi. That wasn't on that Blaze Fahrenheit. Of, Blaze of Glory? Fahrenheit, blah, 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 blah. Uh, no, I don't think so. No, Blaze of Glory was like the Young, young Guns 2 song. What? Yeah. Crap. Okay. Someday I'll be Saturday night. Remember that oh, song? Oh, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Yeah, no, yeah. I'm sorry. That doesn't sound Shot right to me. down in a Blaze of Glory. No, that is Young Guns 2. I'm looking up right now. Oh, Jesus. Let's get to the bottom of it. I'll, Fact while you're check. doing that, I'll name other... Uh, Fact check. Bon well, my whole my whole point um, about Bon Jovi maybe not being upset about the Kill Bon Jovi sticker mm-hmm. or whatever is they were so massive it was kind of like pfft. and Metallica was obviously gaining traction at least puppets they they have a huge buzz about them mm-hmm. but they're still not commercially successful right. Bon Jovi was right totally so they're probably like pfft, we'll buzz that f- those fuckers crowd with our helicopter we don't care about a sticker you know whatever I know that happened afterwards but well he's just got a reputation as being a pretty cool dude yeah. <laughs> She had a nasty reputation as a cruel dude. I basically just <laughs> said innocently a whole verse of Life in the Fast Lane by the Eagles. But um, Yeah, John Bon Jovi, Blaze of Glory. Okay, so the song from Young well, Guns too. Okay, okay. But he has a pretty good reputation as being a, a, a cool guy. So I wonder if he's like, they're like, oh, this these young 22-year-old metalheads right. wrote Kill Bon Jovi. Is he kind of going like, that's funny. Those guys have a lot of... Sp- yeah. Spunk in him. That's cute. This, this, or is he saying to his manager Dot McGee at the time, who would go on to become Kiss's manager? What is what's going on with this James Hetfield? Give me every. I want to know everything about him. You know, like I wonder if back then he was like, kind of, want to go down that road that like Axel and Vince Neil do. Like James Hetfield, we're gonna have a fight. Oh my God, the Vince Neil Axel MTV oh my fight crap. Oh, it's so stupid. Never happened. It could still happen. I guess technically they're both still alive and yeah. both still assholes. I'm going to go ahead and say that Axl Rose would win. 
He's got way, way more fire. It would be a humiliating... He's also lost a lot of weight, and Vince Neil has not. It'd be a humiliating fight for everyone to watch because it would be two soft, fucking blowhard junkies pretending to be hard. But if it was televised, guess who would invite us over to watch it? Paul? Paul! Paul Muck would... He would text us first more than anybody we know. Well... Anyways, what band are we talking about again? Another interesting thing I thought... Um, that I found about that show is they had the cra- the puss head crash course. You know the puss head with like the yeah. skull, but it's like the doctor with the cut open yes, head. Yeah. They had that on the stage as a background. I want that skateboard deck so bad. I know. I know. That's something I, I like. I would love to put some. I don't tr- even skate. In- I would just put it on my wall. Like I, art. I skate and I would still put it on my wall because I don't know if I would want to have that thing scratched up. I think they sell it on the Metallica they do. website. I just, I, I just, I can't pull the trigger and buy uh, the low, low price of one million dollars. One million dollars. Okay. Um, what else can we say about this? So the festival was three shows: the twenty second in London, the 29th in Nuremberg, Germany, and the thirtieth in. Can you say that? Uh, Fortsheim. P F O R Z A. Fortsheim, Germany. Fortsheim, Fortsheim, Germany. Oh, yes, I've, been, I've hovered my copy. The set list they played for these three shows was uh, Creeping Death, Through the Belt Holes, Fade of Black, Leper Messiah, Whiplash, Sanitarium, Seeking the Story, Puppets, Last Caress, Am I Evil, and Battery. Great little, great little set list. Great set list. And also, like, when you're, like, of course, you've got Anthrax up there, Rep and Thrash Metal, Dio, one mm-hmm. of their influences. Of course. But then you have Wasp, Cinderella, and Bon Jovi. Where apparently during the Wasp set, they slowly cut a woman's throat during the set. Mm. Obviously, they didn't really do it. Like an actual throat? <laughs> Theatrics? It was the uh, theater. Yeah. But I mean, I don't know. It had to have been exciting to watch a band like Metallica next to uh, Cinderella. I mean, I like Cinderella. I think they have a lot of great songs. Don't, know, don't Know We Got Till It's Gone. Nobody's Fool. Save Me. Great songs. Okay. But they were still, they're in that glam rock world. Yeah. And you got Metallica and Anthrax up there just like... Here's the new shit, guys. Yeah, this is the new shit for sure. Yeah, and even between those two bands, and I know you're you're a big Anthrax guy. I'm yeah. not as much, but Big Four, of course, they would go on to be the Big Four, right. two of the Big Four. But even between Metallica and Anthrax, such different flavors. Oh, of, of course, thrash. yeah, very much so. Yeah, you know, Anthrax had the, the, their clothes were funny. Yeah, they were, they were goofy funny. Guys. They were goofy. They kind of this funk element. Right. But obviously, still though, very, very purely thrash. Oh yeah, totally. But Metallica, who also in, kind of invented thrash along with these people, Exodus and Testament, Anthrax, moving away from it too in some ways. Oh, yeah. With Sanitarium or yeah or whatever, you know. Yeah, I mean, Anthrax did the same thing when they released uh, Persistence of Time in the early '90s. It was, it was kind of their black album. Their but Metallica, was, I think, would argue, was already sort of doing that. I think Metallica started moving away from thrash with Ride the Lightning. Oh yeah, I agree. Yeah. Fade to black and sanitarium. Yeah, and, you know the thing that should not be to me doesn't sound like thrash. It's doomy, slow. Right, exactly. Gun, 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 gun. Yep. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, of course. Um, okay, so the next, so that kind of rounds out the summer for the boys. Yeah, this, like we said before, this wasn't a super busy year of touring for them. Right, they made the record, they released it. They're in Europe doing Monsters of Rock. Three of the biggest shows I'll ever... I mean, those the attendance of those shows were massive. Yeah, it was at least like, what, 8,000 people or yeah, something? Yeah, 150 people. 150. Minimum. It was like their friends were there. Literally minimum. I'm just the saying. The other bands watched them. <laughs> uh, the next thing we get, the beloved November 17th, 1987, Cliff Amal, that they called the 1998 home video, was released. Which one for of many the coolest, of us, one of the coolest releases they've ever done. But for many of us, like the footage from this film, we've seen it's all in the behind the music, like those interviews with Dave Mustaine in the band and stuff. Oh, yeah. Like we've seen all that a million times. That's the original source of it. Yeah, totally. The day on the green stuff. Yep. And we're gonna do a whole episode. So the Joshua Toomey, who does a Talk Toomey podcast, we're gonna have him on to do a whole episode on Cliff Amal. Yeah. So we don't need to spend too much time on it. For those of you don't know what it is, maybe we have some younger listeners. It's a retrospective on the three and a half years Cliff was in the band. All home home video kind it's of like, stuff. Well, there's some of it's professional video. Yeah, well the stuff the stuff from Day on the Green or whatever right. is is all professionally shot, but, but there's a lot of behind the scenes yeah. like they had, you know, remember when you're, you you were a kid and your your parents had like the old school camcorder, but it was actually a full on VHS, VHS yeah. in the thing. It's footage like that where it's like you just, you know, nowadays you can download a VHS app or whatever, but it's so cool to see 
This this was actually one of the first things I saw visually of Metallica besides the one video. Me too. My friend had Cliff them all. I'm like, whoa, what is this? Like, dude, it's all this behind the scenes footage, road footage, show footage, all this stuff. And it was so cool because like a lot of it is stuff that like nowadays people get access to because of social media and stuff. But back or then, YouTube they, they, or something. Yeah, they were giving their fans a glimpse of like, hey, yeah, here's the shows, here's this and that, but here's what goes on backstage. Well, yeah, like, here, well, yeah, like here's Cliff smoking a joint backstage. Right. Or it's like the dudes having beers, yeah. you know. Totally. Talking about Cliff and they're getting drunk. And mm-hmm. I always love the whole, they're like, he's like, don't move, I'll be right back to get them more beer. Yeah. And James and Kirk don't move. Yeah. And then he moves their arms. Like also, such dumb humor. But yeah, you also saw the 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 humorous side to these guys too right. in this video like it was the first time the I goofiness, saw goofiness yeah I saw the one video I'm like these guys are scary as fuck and <laughs> totally see, these guys are demons yeah they see Cliff them all and they're just acting like goofballs and right. I'm like but, it, but as a fan it was like man they're just human beings totally. like having a good time touring like brought it all down to earth totally man they, they, they didn't at any point to me in that video come across as like oh yeah these guys are untouchable rock stars totally you know? yeah and I think that that had a lot to do with the punk aesthetic was yeah. They rejected that shit. Yeah. We don't want that. We're, you know, there was all that talk about like their fashion, you know? Yeah. They're like, these are just the clothes that we wear when we're at our house. Yeah. We just walk, happen to walk on stage with them on. Which contextually was in a huge contrast to the Bon Jovis who were very, you know, affectated in what they were wearing. The teased out hair. Oh, yeah, for sure. The elaborate fucking snake pants and shit. Back then, Bon Jovi had to, like, get ready for a show. Right, they had like, a whole wardrobe for yes. the show. They had probably a stylist. Whereas Metallica stuff. was literally going out on the Aussie tour wearing what they put on that day in the bus. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure that the, the, the day that James broke his wrist on the Aussie tour probably didn't change his clothes, just got, like, a cast and then <laughs> right. went on stage, you know? So we'll just briefly run through kind of what you see in this film. So the first thing you see is Creeping Death, Am I Evil, and Damage, Inc. from the Detroit April 4th, 1986 show on the Aussie tour. Then we see puppets from the Long Island April 28th tour. And the little caption says, still drunk on the Aussie tour. Yeah, totally. Then we get Anesthesia and Whiplash from The Stone in San Francisco in March of 83, which was Cliff's second gig. Yeah, that's so cool. Which we're lucky to have... You know, we're lucky to have that material. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's... It's... Documents of that. Yeah, you know? it's a... God, it's such a... It feels like an honor to be able to still watch that to this day. Totally. To be like, totally wow, this does. is the second show Cliff ever did. Then we get uh, Cliff Solo, Forsman, Faded Black, and Seek from a September 14th, 1985 show at the Metal Hammer Festival in Germany when they were headlining with Venom, Nazareth, and as they wrote, Beer. Beer, Yeah. <laughs> We get Sanitarium and another version of Anesthesia from Denmark, July 6, 86 at the Roskilde Festival, which this is one of their oddest big festivals. Phil Collins, Eric Clapton, Elvis Costello, and Big Country. <laughs> That's an odd bill. I mean, I love Phil Collins, Eric Clapton, and Elvis Costello. I don't know what Big Country is, but I love those first three. Uh, what was Big Country's huge song? Um, fuck. Gone country. Gone country. It's Alan Jackson. Whoopsie. <laughs> and the thunder rolls. Don't break my heart. Mikey, break your heart. We're going to get some Billy Ray Cyrus in here? I okay. Just, just did. Okay. Let's see. Big country. What was her big song? I'm going to find this. It was called Big Country. Actually, let me just do the thing that we've basically said was stupid earlier. Just go to Spotify. Oh, boy. It's quick and easy. That's why I like it so much. Well, then much. we get another Cliff Solo and Bells from the Day on the Green, which was August 31st, 1985. No remorse of Metal Militia from the Metro show they played in Chicago on their yeah. first tour, the Kill em All for One tour with Raven, right. which the, I love that show. Oh, it's then, such, the such Metro, a great show. Which I played before. It's just so weird. I know. It's, it, it is crazy. Like, you and I have been touring for so long now. Like, we're, we're, we're playing venues, and now that we've done this Metallica podcast and have dug really deep into, like, where they've played and wh- whatnot... To be in venues that Metallica's played. Kane's Ballroom, the Troubadour. Right. Like, and Metro. I'm talking small venues, like arenas, whatever, that's cool. But like, sure, I've been in Madison Square Garden, so is Metallica. Mm-hmm. Whatever. The but clubs like, feel different. Right. When you're in the Metro and like- The, the clubs are different. Or even here, right here in Nashville, like uh, Exit Inn, like the first time I played Exit Inn, I knew the Clash had played there at one point. Right. And the police had played there. I'm like, this is wow. cool. Like- or like the Municipal Auditorium, which I've played before. Yeah. Which that's where they played. That yep. was actually the first show they played with John Marshall on guitar. Yeah. After the wrist accident in 86. Right. 
Exactly. Um, I just recently was uh, talking about um, Starwood Amphitheater, the old amphitheater. Yeah, I never got to see a show there. That's before my time. Here. I saw a few a few shows there when I first moved to Nashville. I saw like which that's a shed for the shed. Yeah, they what was a, it like? Ten thousand? Yeah, I, mean, I would say ten to fifteen. It was because nor- there was a big open lawn. Yeah, n- normal size amphitheater in, that are like in most cities, but um, it's still there to this day. It's rotting and like th- it's overgrown and seats are torn up and graffiti. It's really sad, but. Um, uh, I did. Speaking of some '80s glam rock, I saw a show there one time in o two or o three. It was Poison, Cinderella, Winger, and Faster Pussycat. God, wow! I missed Faster Pussycat because I never cared for them. Um, Don Jameson, the comedian who did that metal show with Jim Florentine yeah. and Eddie Trunk, is on tour with Faster Pussycat right now, opening doing a comedy set. Interesting. I okay. never liked them either. Yeah. Um, I'm just tying it into the present. That's all. No big deal. But uh, anyways, it was a great amphitheater, all that stuff. Um, where were we at? Talking about venues? Well, you were talking about seeing Faster Pussycat and the Cinderella and Poison at well, Starwood. Well, right. I'm just trying to... And how it's all grown over now, but you... It, yeah, no. It's I'm, kind I'm of just, abandoned now. It is, ab- it is abandoned now, yeah. I think we got on the subject of this because of venues and seeing... How cool it was to play a venue where you saw right. some cool shit. Exactly. Um, Did you ever play Starwood? Never played Starwood. Um, have played Municipal Auditorium, though. Mm-hmm. Um, and that one's cool in Nashville. If you haven't been to Nashville, uh, if you go check it out, there's actually a Musicians Hall of Fame in the same building now. And on the outside, they've redone it where there's like huge blown up co- copies of old ticket stubs there. Mm. It's a, a way of, it's like their, their little wall of fame kind of thing. Right. It's pretty cool. But, um, oh, I was getting to it because I recently came across some footage on YouTube of Metallica playing Starwood. Oh, what? It was like 91, 92. It oh. was like Black Almera. Was it the Shit It's the Sheds tour from 94? It might have been. We'll have to look it up that after we're done recording. That would make sense. Because um, they I, did that whole Shed summer thing. Right. I was looking up because there, there was a video that someone posted of Starwood Amphitheater like in ruins, and it came oh, up. They did Starwood on the damage. They did, they did Injustice for All. In 89. Was it? Okay. Is okay. That, that might have been what it you saw. Have, yeah, we'll look it up after we're done My recording. guitar tech, Doyle, was telling me a few months ago that he saw that gig. Oh, crazy. And that it was, he said it was pretty wild. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. And Starwood's not, it's not technically in Nashville. It's like Antioch or something. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's like outside, kind of outside the city. Which we have a sin now, which is right downtown. Right downtown. And it's that's like, kind of. That's the, like a half size amphitheater. Yeah, it's smaller. It's like, I think the cap there is like 7,000. Yeah. Um. So Clint and I could sell it out, no problem, but maybe yeah, not Starwood. Easy. Yeah. Anyways. Um. <laughs> Anyways, venues. How do we get on the subject? Well, we're of talking venues? about them playing the metro. Oh, right, right, how yeah, surreal yeah. it is! It's like you know, for, for us diehards, for us trues out here. Yeah, that metro footage is so fascinating um, on many levels. The you know the the whole um, we got a new record called "Kill 'Em All." We're happy to kill yeah. you all tonight. And he throws it out, and like it just immediately gets destroyed. And yeah. James is like, "Well, I don't think anyone got that one. Uh, we destroyed another copy." And this is also the show where. Kirk takes his Gibson V, that burgundy V. Yeah. Or maybe it's black. It's like a black and white one, I think. And he's like putting it above the crowd and they just take it. Yeah, they start grabbing it. <laughs> and at one point it comes off of him and he, he kind of shrugs his he shoulders. He shrugs. Like, oh, well. And one of their roadies literally just jumps feet first into the crowd. Yeah. I mean, it's just some rough shit. He goes to get that shit back. He's just and he like, does. Yeah. Because cause if he hadn't done that, that guitar would have gotten obliterated. They would have oh, fucking yeah. just torn it apart. Oh, yeah. Not but yeah, knowing but what Kirk they're... doing that like it's like well eight, it's nine, gone it's like 1983 Kirk just like well you guys really took that wow, people in Chicago are really brutal well, James uh, even says that he says he says this is the roughest crowd we've ever had we yeah. love he says we love it and we love it but that would have scared it's me metal oh yeah for sure and I also thought too I would have been laughing my ass off if I had been like Cliff maybe I had a joint before yeah. and I watched that happen to Kirk while during his solo <laughs> yeah. I would have been laughing my fucking ass off. Oh, for sure. <laughs> I'm like, whoa, dude, they took your guitar. <laughs> you fucking idiot. <laughs> what the hell, bro? Don't give those animals your instrument. Yeah. <laughs> well, that kind of wraps up 1987. Yeah. Um, 1988 is going to be a big year. Of course, we got the the writing and recording of Justice. And Never heard of it. <laughs> it's a small record. Yeah. Not with, really a milestone with no record breakout for them. song. Yeah, yeah nothing, no, nothing, nothing notable happened. No, so we'll we'll breeze through that. There might be a bonus episode or something. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, even though that eighty seven, and we're going to come across other years that there's not a lot of activity from the band. But a year like this, there's some really cool, notable stuff. Obviously, Garage Days. You've got Cliff Amal. I mean, 
Well, there's some people, I mean... Memorable shows. Br- Brad Blazik just did a, um, an episode of Alpha Metallica with our friend Tom. Right. And, uh, oh my God, what's the song they talk about? Oh, they, they talk about Helpless. Okay. And Brad, who we know, single podcast theory, yeah. a friend of ours took me to the Snake Pit in St. Louis. He's talking about how just the time that that the Garage Days re-revisited hit for him, Yeah, it's like one of the most important Metallica records for him. Well, yeah, it's a, it's his intro. It's just, for so many people, those five songs just defined the attitude of Metallica for decades. Totally. You know? Well, yeah, I mean, well, it, 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 there's something special about a band you grow to love and becomes one of your favorite bands that the first thing you heard is very special to you. Yeah. You know, for me, it was one, and it was mm-hmm. Justice. Um, so for Blazek, it's like... Yeah, Garage Days, like, I, yeah, it's all covers. But. Which is fascinating because it's a band that would go on to be more and more known for um, the detail of production. Right. This is a really interesting little footnote in the story because Puppets, from Kill 'em All all the way through, the whole thread has been yeah. an increase in production value. Right. But we have this one little footnote in between two of arguably their most, some of their most produced tight records. Right, yeah. Master of Puppets and Injustice for All that is literally just them loose as it's fuck. Punk rock. I mean, it's total the entire punk project rock. done in six days. Total I mean, punk rock. Yeah. James Humming it. and the weirds fluffy and even the outro of the Holy P is them the the run to the hills uh, Iron Maiden yeah that part it's bow, like bow, bow. they're kind of fucking it up on purpose right. and it just sounds like shit and that's it's, the ending of the EP. It's real loose. Love it. It's awesome. It's a it, fun it, record. It's an interesting breath of fresh air. Yeah. And that's when I think of metallic. When I think of and it's telling of what a nerd I am <laughs> that I do think of Metallica in 1987. When I think of 1987 Metallica, I think of Garage Days. Yeah, of I course. think of Jason. Yeah. Um, Jason's first full year in the band. Uh, yeah, that's those are the two things I really think about. Jason Newstead and Garage Days Re-Revisited. Yeah. And I hear Last Caress run through my head. Yep. That's, that's 87 Metallica for yep, me. Yep, for sure. I was nine. I was four. So obviously... I wasn't burning this down in real time. Yeah, I was at the Metro show. <laughs> <laughs> totally. They, even though they didn't play the Metro in 87. Um, yeah, that was 83. 83, yeah. I was five. In 87, where were they even playing in Chicago? The Riviera Theater? Yeah, maybe. Which is like, it's a big, it's like a 13, 1500 yeah. club. I mean, at this point, I mean, I could, I could see them still Post going, going, going back to the Metro just for like. Well, because they did know. arenas with Ozzy. So right. then, what, the opener. what would they be coming back through as a headliner? Big clubs, probably. Big clubs. They're I not mean, going to come back and do arenas. No, no. I mean, the Metro is not like gigantic, but it's a good sized club. The Metro is like 500, 300? No, it's bigger than that. The Metro? I thought the Metro was like pushing 1,000. Oh, I don't know. Do I need to look it up? Do I? Well, why not? For all of our fans in Chicago, New Jersey, who are just right now yelling at their computer screen, their iPhone, whatever. Their dad. Their dad. We're going to find this out once and for all. The Metro Chicago capacity. Guess who's closer? I don't know. If this was the price is right, I would have gotten closest without going over. It's 1100 1100 1100 So isn't that crazy though? Like on Kill 'em All, they're playing an 1100 cap club. Now in this footage from Cliff 'em All, it looks like it's packed. I'd imagine it is. It is packed. I mean, the camera's not in the very, very back. I'm more shocked because I've I've played there before and I don't remember it being that big. That's what it says according to the Google. Well, the all-knowing eye of the Google. Yeah. Now, yeah, it opened in '82. Metro's first in '82. Capacity is 1100. Wow, interesting. Divided between the main floor and the balcony. Uh, Maybe balcony you was played close. in balcony was balcony close. Was close Bla- for sure. Blacked out, as they say. <laughs> well, it's going to be fun to continue rolling through the years. Yeah, it will be. You know, uh, we got a really good response to the Hetfield Gear episode. Yeah, I think we, we're going we, to tap back into Gear World. We're going to do some Kirk stuff. Yeah. Like I said, we're going to have our friend uh, Toomey on to talk about Cliff Them All. Yeah. We're going to have Slipknot's drummer on. Our friend Bruce from Living Sacrifice. Yeah, he wants to do it. We're going to have Tom Quee back on the show. Yeah, James Hetfield, <laughs> Lars Ulrich. Dio from D- Heaven. Yeah, Dio's going to yeah. come down from Heaven. We're going to have uh, Caligula um, on the show. And we got some good stuff planned. We got some cool stuff happening. Um, you know, it is a bit tough, you know. It's He's clawing your Cutlass, like, gold record. Oh, there's a cat down here. My friend's cat is staying with me right now. And 
hey, get away. Like literally clawing <laughs> the record plaque. Ethan has all these like gold and shit records because he's <sighs> he's had a nice career. This cat was just clawing that. Well, thanks to everyone who listens. Uh, we're having a good time. Oh, yeah. Ethan and I are super busy. We're trying to figure out that he's finishing his new record, which, by the way... It's basically done. The record's done. I have heard it. It's quite good. You have played on it. And we decided we wanted to play out the episode with the song that yeah. I played on, so you can get a little taste of the record. Yeah. And I imagine is... you're going to do a whole Metal Up Your Podcast radio on the new record. I think I probably will. I mean, at least like a, a I think preview of a song. But yeah. Should we just play him this entire track, or... So this is a song called Stand Down yeah. from Ethan's new record. Uh, I was lucky enough to be invited to come to the Smokestack, which is Paul's studio, and play a play kind of a melodic, ambient, moody thing on it. It's very cool because it's not like uh, what you would normally think of as a solo. Clint just laid down some cool stuff. He came in, did it in one take, by the way. Mm -hmm. He plugged into my rig. I basically just turned on a couple pedals that I feel would be fitting to Clint's sound and what he kind of does with the ambient stuff. And uh, I just said, hey, this is in G minor. Go. We hit record, and Clint played this thing, and we, he finished, and we're like, yep, that's it. Yeah. So it's it's the instrumental section after the second chorus. All the beautiful little high note stuff and ambient stuff is all Clint. All the stuff that makes you feel like you want to do sex. Things that make you go, hmm. <laughs> well, thanks to everyone who listens. We love you all. Go leave the review at iTunes. Go consider getting on the ride on the level of Patreon. Uh, we're not anywhere near stopping this train. Oh, no. Every Monday, more Metallica talk. And we do appreciate everyone who's on the ride. Yes, thank you very much. We always, always appreciate it. So we'll see you on the flip-flop. Let's just go ahead and get out of here. Peace. Let's do it. Adios. Peace, peace. peace adios. Peace. Adios. If you were our advisor, what would you say? Then I would say, delete that. Tell them we'll fight So no one else has to say goodbye